Chapter Forty Eight. In the afternoon, the farmer made it known that the rick was to be finished that night, since there was a moon by which they could see to work, and the man with the engine was engaged for another farm on the morrow. Hence, the twanging and humming and rustling proceeded with even less intermission than usual. It was not till namet time, about three o'clock, that Tess raised her eyes and gave a momentary glance round. She felt but little surprise at seeing that Alec d'Urberville had come back and was standing under the hedge by the gate. He had seen her lift her eyes and waved his hand urbanely to her while he blew her a kiss. It meant that their quarrel was over. Tess looked down again and carefully abstained from gazing in that direction. Thus the afternoon dragged on. The wheat rick shrank lower, and the straw rick grew higher, and the corn sacks were carted away. At six o'clock the wheat rick was about shoulder high from the ground, but the unthreshed sheaves remaining untouched seemed countless still, notwithstanding the enormous numbers that had been gulped down by the insatiable swallower fed by the man and Tess, through whose young hands the greater part of them had passed and the immense stack of straw, where in the morning there had been nothing, appeared as the faeces of the same buzzing red glutton. From the west sky a wrathful shine, all that wild march could afford in the way of sunset, had burst forth after the cloudy day, flooding the tired and sticky faces of the threshers, and dyeing them with a coppery light, as also the flapping garments of the women which clung to them like dull flames. A panting ache ran through the rick. The man who fed was weary, and Tess could see that the red nape of his neck was encrusted with dirt and husks. She still stood at her post, her flushed and perspiring face coated with the corn-dust, and her white bonnet embrowned by it. She was the only woman whose place was upon the machine so as to be shaken bodily by its spinning, and the decrease of the stack now separated her from Marian and Iz, and prevented their changing duties with her as they had done. The incessant quivering, in which every fibre of her frame participated, had thrown her into a stupefied reverie in which her arms worked on independently of her consciousness. She hardly knew where she was and did not hear Is Hewitt tell her from below that her hair was tumbling down. By degrees the freshest among them began to grow cadaverous and saucer-eyed. Whenever Tess lifted her head she beheld always the great upgrown straw stack, with the men in shirt-sleeves upon it, against the grey north sky. In front of it the long red elevator, like a Jacob's ladder, on which a perpetual stream of threshed straw ascended, a yellow river running uphill and spouting out on the top of the rick. She knew that Alec d'Urberville was still on the scene, observing her from some point or other, though she could not say where. There was an excuse for his remaining, for when the threshed rick drew near its final sheaves a little ratting was always done and men unconnected with the threshing sometimes dropped in for that performance, sporting characters of all descriptions, gents with terriers and facetious pipes, roughs with sticks and stones. But there was another hour's work before the layer of live rats at the base of the stack would be reached, and as the evening light in the direction of Giant's Hill by Abbot's Churnal dissolved away, the white-faced moon of the season arose from the horizon that lay towards Middleton Abbey and Shottsford on the other side. For the last hour or two Marian had felt uneasy about Tess, whom she could not get near enough to speak to, the other women having kept up their strength by drinking ale, and Tess having done without it through traditionary dread owing to its results at her home in childhood but Tess still kept going. If she could not fill her part she would have to leave, and this contingency, which she would have regarded with equanimity and even relief a month or two earlier, 
had become a terror since d'Urberville had begun to hover around her. The sheaf pitchers and feeders had now worked the rick so low that people on the ground could talk to them. To Tess's surprise, Farmer Groby came up on the machine to her, and said that if she desired to join her friend, he did not wish her to keep on any longer, and would send somebody else up to take her place. The friend was d'Urberville, she knew, and also that this concession had been granted in obedience to the request of that friend or enemy. She shook her head and toiled on. The time for the rat-catching arrived at last, and the hunt began. The creatures had crept downwards with the subsidence of the rick, till they were all together at the bottom, and being now uncovered from their last refuge, they ran across the open ground in all directions. A loud shriek from the, by this time, half-tipsy Marion, informing her companions that one of the rats had invaded her person a terror which the rest of the women had guarded against by various schemes of skirt-tucking and self-elevation. The rat was at last dislodged, and, amid the barking of dogs, masculine shouts, feminine screams, oaths, stampings and confusion as of pandemonium, Tess untied her last sheaf. The drum slowed, the whizzing ceased, and she stepped down from the machine to the ground. Her lover, who had only looked on at the rat-catching, was promptly at her side. "'What, after all, my insulting slap, too?' she said in an under-breath. She was so utterly exhausted that she had not strength to speak louder. "'I should indeed be foolish to feel offended at anything you say or do,' he answered in the seductive voice of the Trantridge time. "'How the little limbs tremble!' You are as weak as a bled calf, you know you are, and yet you need to have done nothing since I arrived. How could you be so obstinate? However, I have told the farmer that he has no right to employ women at steam-threshing. It is not proper work for them, and on all the better class of farms it has been given up, as he knows very well. I will walk with you as far as your home.' 